And good afternoon, everybody. So um, like Jonathan said, we originally had these meetings scheduled to take place in the state. We had them scheduled for Lawton and Tulsa um, today and tomorrow. And so regrettably, we have had to reschedule those to this format. So I was really looking forward to seeing everybody in person today and uh, just kind of feeling like we're back onto some sort of level of normalcy, but I guess maybe for another time we'll get, we'll all be able to get together again. So um, also like Jonathan said, we're gonna be hosting a series of these webinars based on your feedback um, and some of your needs with um, in regards to financial and operational assistance that our, our um, friends at Stradwire would be able to provide. So um, I'm just gonna quickly introduce Jonathan. He kind of gave some, some background information as well. So um, once we kick things off and um, at the end of the presentation, we'll ask for, ask for questions and feedback. Um, please feel free to provide um, any responses, any questions that you have for, for Jonathan and for myself um, on as far as how we move forward with these, uh, with our webinars. So um, as some background, Jonathan joined Stroudwater in 2016 and is currently a principal with the firm. He brings um, a strong record of leadership in rural healthcare with over 16 years of progressively responsible experiencing, experience advising profit, nonprofit, and government entities through complex issues, which include cost reduction, acquisition contracts, financial analyses, and operations. So um, I just thank everybody for being here with us today and also Jonathan for your time. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Corey. And what I'll ask is um, if everybody can put their phones on mute, uh, just so we don't get any type of feedback or reverberation coming through the phone. Um, if there are any questions, uh, you know, please feel free as we're going through the presentation. I don't mind somebody interrupting me to ask a question. Um, that may be more conducive than me trying to go all the way through and people remembering at the end. So again, as Corey had mentioned, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to come up with different presentations that would help the critical access hospitals to improve financial performance. Um, the first one will be more of a general overview, um, financial and operational best practices. And what we wanna look at is, is a number of different opportunities will allow organizations to improve their financial position. Um, talking for the next hour, hopefully people don't mind, they may pick up my water or my Starbucks and drink occasionally, so there may be some momentary pauses. When we talk about the different things that we're looking at, and, and it's forever the people that haven't seen this before. What we're looking at is, is healthcare is changing. And what's up on our screen right now is the population health transition framework. And what this framework really is, is it, it explains how healthcare is changing and moving forward. And as we continue to look at this, what we can't do is continue business as usual. And I think this entire COVID event, for one thing, has shown us that as healthcare is changing and we have momentary lapses in volume, um, it can significantly impact the financial organization itself. So if we're not having those recurring optional surgeries or we're not having those clinic visits or if we're not having all of those other things happen, it can significantly impact the financial performance of our organization. So what the transition framework does is we use this as a basis of a lot of the engagement and it leads us to believe that, okay, as we start to move forward more towards a population-based or health outcome-based uh, reimbursement system, we're gonna have to change how we start to approach business. Um, so a lot of times what will end up happening is, is we may get into this in more detail. And, and the major areas is really on the delivery system, the payment system, and overall population health. Those are the three major sections of this graphic. And it'll kind of be the foundation as we start to move forward. When we talk about the specific opportunities, our firm generally does about 100 of what we call SFOAs a year. And that's a strategic financial operational assessment. And what these are, these are one-on-one -on -one engagements where we will go into a hospital and we'll engage the entire leadership team and staff over a couple day period. We'll review things like cost reports, we'll review metrics, we'll review financial performance, we'll discuss quality. We'll look at all of those different factors. And what we wanna do is we use that information to target specific operational improvements for those organizations. So as we look at this document today and we work through these different components, 
These are many of the recommendations that we see consistently across all of those organizations. So we may go into a hundred different organizations and these are the ones that are really top on the list. Now, as we're going through this today, and this presentation will be available, um, as we're going through this today, use it as a checklist. You know, as we're looking at these different opportunities, how many of these are we doing ourselves? Are there some things that we can actually do? Are there certain things that maybe we are doing or aren't doing? And use it as a baseline to say, okay, maybe we're doing half of these, but the other half are certain things that we can actually target and work on as a means to improve the position going forward. And again, not all of these will improve the financial position. Some will improve efficiency. Some will improve clinical outcomes. Again, it's to look at all of those across the board to say, how can we improve the organization as a whole? They are broken up into major sections. So things like economic philosophy, cost report improvement, revenue, revenue cycle improvement, provider alignment. We're gonna go through each of those different areas as a means, again, to try to improve the position of your organization. The first one we're really going to look at is the economic philosophy. And with economic philosophy, it's really the approach of how we look at critical access hospitals. Now, some of us are in systems, some of us are independent, but when we look at critical access hospitals, we need to realize that we're different than how other organizations are reimbursed from Medicare perspective and through the cost report. So a lot of larger PPS hospitals, the Medicare cost report is not as relevant to them as it us to us as a critical access hospital, where we're getting that cost-based reimbursement. And what that means is that as our cost continues to increase, just through stepping that through the cost report, our reimbursements will also increase. As our cost decreases, our reimbursements will decrease. As our volume goes up, our reimbursements will go down. And as our volume goes down, our reimbursements will go up. So there's that direct correlation to volume and expenses that's different than the PPS hospital. So again, as we increase our volume, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna increase our financial position based on how that steps through the cost report and that overall impact. As we start to engage in conversations, and this is something that we're looking at CFOs and controllers and other individuals, we really want to establish an environment that we explain this to those that are actually in the department. So our emergency department manager, our lab directors, our radiology directors, all of those different departments, we want to ensure that they understand how cost-based reimbursement works because it'll change ultimately the approach as to how they're creating budgets and how they're starting to hold themselves accountable for the increase in certain performance. What we also want to do is we also want to evaluate and realize that each individual department is responsible to provide a contribution margin to the organization as a whole. And what we do is a lot of times we'll walk into a hospital and we'll say, hey, how are things going? How's financial performance? And a lot of times what they'll look at is they'll say, oh, well, this program we need to get rid of because it's not producing financially. It's realizing that that program may not be producing financially from a certain perspective, but realizing that all programs at some level will provide a contribution margin. And as we start to delete out or remove programs, there's a fixed amount of overhead costs that will just get reallocated to other departments. So again, what we need to do is we need to evaluate each program separately, but then we also need to evaluate the impact of those programs on the overall financial performance of the organization. We can't just assume that if we get rid of a program that that's gonna improve the position of the hospital because of what's gonna happen is, is those costs are gonna get reallocated, the fixed costs to other departments, which will improve or worsen the hospital from a contribution margin perspective. So again, it's peeling back the different layers of the onion to ensure that we're providing services and that we're also evaluating those programs at different levels and not just evaluating them at a single level. The next area we're really gonna talk about is provider complement. And this one could go in a thousand different directions. The, the first one I really like to say, and this is really important as we're looking at going after things like health professional shortage areas or understanding the services that are provided within our community. We wanna create a catalog of all of the providers that are within our community. And the reason for that is one, so that we can understand the services that are being provided 
and the providers that are providing those services. And second, so we can really go after those different things like a shortage area designation. Now those shortage area designations can help us for certain initiatives such as rural health clinics or qualifying for loan forgiveness for our physicians. It's looking at those factors. And what it allows you to do is as we create that catalog of services, it allows us to actually engage and to more effectively reach out if we need to expand service delivery or if we want to actually allow or target certain providers to expand services within our community. Again, what we wanna do is we wanna have that full understanding of the providers within our community. It's hard to actually assess potential gaps within the service delivery if we don't have that full uh, list of providers that are actually providing services. The next, I know I presented on this a couple years ago at the annual conferences, really to look at how we are providing primary care and realizing that when we look at all those different designations, necessarily the most optimal or the preferred designation, there are other opportunities where we can actually provide certain services under an alternative designation that may yield us a higher financial performance. So an example is maybe we have some freestanding clinics that are only getting provider-based or um, fee schedule reimbursement. Maybe it'd be more advantageous for them to actually be a provider-based rural health clinic. Maybe we have some provider-based clinics that would be more advantageous to be a rural health clinic or vice versa. Maybe we have some rural health clinics that would be more advantageous to be a provider-based clinic. What it's really saying is, is that we want to continue to evaluate those different designation opportunities to ensure that the one we have is optimal for the practices and also so the relationship that we have, whether we're independent or within a system. Same thing from a system perspective. For those hospitals that have a system relationship, it's saying that what we want to do is we want to constantly evaluate the alignment of practices within that system to ensure that they're optimally aligned. So if we have a bunch of practices that are aligned under a 200 bed facility, maybe those would be better served to actually be aligned under a critical access hospital as a rural health clinic or as a provider-based clinic. So again, it's saying to look at all of those different opportunities to ensure that we're receiving optimal reimbursement. The next one kind of builds off that. Um, it's saying continue to evaluate our specialty providers. If we have employed specialty providers or if we have visiting specialty providers, I think one thing that COVID is showing is, is that many people are going to be less likely to travel far distances to receive healthcare services. I think a lot more people are going to either expect those services to be provided in their community, whether it's through telehealth or whether it's through a specialist actually coming to the communities. But I think it's important to start to evaluate the specialty services that we have in our community to ensure one, that we're meeting patient demand but two, that we're actually providing access to that care for patients. As we continue to move more towards a population health reimbursement methodology, we want to ensure that specialty providers are a part of that spectrum of care and the full continuum of care. What we don't want to do is continue to provide services or require patients to have to travel or not get certain services um, because they're just not available, whether it's through telehealth or other means. The next one is really looking at our physician contract. I know that this can go in a thousand different areas or ways, but what I want to say about physician contracts is to realize that as we continue to move more towards health outcomes and quality scores and performance, we want to continue to look at our physician contracts to ensure that we're moving those in the same direction. We continue to go into another a number of hospitals where the physician contracts are limited solely to flat rates, where a physician just gets an annual salary with no performance outcomes, no quality outcomes, or anything around work RVUs. We want to continue to move that forward to say that as the business changes and the industry changes, we want to ensure that the physician contracts are also changing to keep up with that. So continue to look at whether we want to include panel sizes, work RVUs, quality scores, patient satisfaction scores. We want to continue to change those contracts so that providers continue to realize that as the metrics for how we are evaluated as firms relative to that, we continue to hold them to those same standards from a performance perspective.
The next one, what we want to look at is, again, whether we're employed providers or whether we have independent providers in our community, we want to continue to build out those relationships with primary care providers to strengthen those relationships. So whether it's functional alignment, contractual alignment, or governance alignment, we really want to make sure that we're engaging those providers within our communities. As there continues to be a push towards ACOs, um, the worst thing that can happen for us is to have a number of independent providers in our communities that we don't have a relationship with that sign up with an ACO in some other region where they're actually getting now a financial incentive to send patients outside of your service area to get services because of the financial benefit from that perspective. So what we want to do is we want to continue to build out those relationships. And it's not to say we're getting guarantees or we're forcing patients to come to our hospitals. It's saying that what we want to do is we want to evaluate from the perspective and create those linkages and those relationships to improve the alignment, but then also improve the access and continuity of care. The next one is really around fair market assessments. Um, I can't tell you how many organizations we go into that are not doing fair market assessments around their providers. Uh, to give you an example, I was out at a hospital uh, about six to eight months ago um, where we went in and there was a primary care physician that was actually making about six, $700,000 a year. They were making that amount of money because they were paid on a work RVU. They were also getting a bunch of add-on revenue for serving as medical director and all of these different functions. The problem is, is that their contract did not delineate or differentiate how they were compensated and where they were compensated. So what was happening is, is their contract just gave them a flat rate and said, you're getting X dollars, and then they were getting all these work RVUs. Once they added up all of the different ways that that provider could earn revenue, it significantly passed what was reasonable around a fair market assessment for their contract. So again, we want to make sure that we're doing those fair market contracts. What makes this a little bit more important, too, is for critical access hospitals, especially those that are operating rural health clinics, where a portion of the cost is reimbursed through the cost report under that rural health clinic, we want to make sure that the cost is reasonable. Um, if we end up passing on an unreasonable cost, it could end up getting us in trouble with the way of recoupment or other penalties around that for not conducting the fair market assessment. From the next perspective of OPPE and FPPE, what we want to look at is even though we're not required to be a part of joint commission, it's still good to use those standards as a means to hold our providers accountable and looking at the actual outcomes of those providers. So what we want to do is we want to continue to do the ongoing professional practice evaluation and the focused professional practice evaluation. Even if we're not required, it's a good standard to actually have in place and to ensure that we're following so that as we're doing those different evaluations and as we're working with our providers, that we're ensuring that they're meeting certain standards. The next one is really on the team-based care approach. Um, some organizations are doing this, some are not. What I really wanna highlight about the team-based care approach is saying that as we look forward, we really wanna make sure that everybody's operating at the top of their license. So what we don't wanna do is if we have a physician with an RN and an MA and a physician practice, we don't want the physician doing things that the nurse can do. We don't want the nurse doing things that the MA can do. What we really want to do is we want to have that MA do every single thing possible until their license actually prevents them from doing anything else. Same thing with the RN. We want the RN doing everything until they're no longer able to do that service and then up to the physician level or the APP. So what we want to do is we want to have the physicians or the providers actually focused on things that require their license to do and not focused on things that other individuals can do. This is the way that we can actually further leverage people and increase the quality and actually access to care by not having our physicians or providers get bogged down into a lot of either administrative functions or certain things that would not require their actual license to do. And then the last one really around the provider complement is really using MGMA information. Um, if we don't have direct access, a lot of times we can get it through the state office. 
What we really want to look at is we want to ensure that as we're paying our providers, we want to ensure that they're actually established within the standards of MGMA from a compensation perspective. So we can either set a benchmark to say that our goal is to have our providers between the 25th and 75th percentile and looking at those certain services. What we don't want to do is we don't want to create those outliers where we're paying our provider at the 100th percentile. But then from a productivity perspective, we find out they're only working at the 20th percentile. So again, it's using that and leveraging that information to ensure that what we're compensating our providers correlates to what's reasonable, but then also from a productivity perspective. So I'll take a quick pause for a second before we move into the inpatient section to see if there's any questions um, or any comments around that. Usually if we were um, in a large conference room, I would just call on people and ask them if they were doing that. Um, but since we're not, I will give a momentary break. All right, everybody must be bashful today, so I will keep going. The next section is really around inpatient services. Now, inpatient services is both the swing bed services, observation services, and acute and operating those services. When we look at inpatient services, what we want to look at is realizing that as critical access hospitals, we have a large amount of fixed cost that actually gets allocated to those critical access hospitals. So what we want to do is we want to ensure that as we're doing those services, that one, we're providing services based on the need, but two, that we're also ensuring that we're working forward to one, continue to create those efficiencies, but also continue to leverage staff for the providing of those services. So what we want to look at first is the target admission rate for the emergency department. Many organizations that we go into from an acute perspective will often transfer a large number of patients to a larger facility. And they'll say, oh, as a critical access hospital, we should not be providing those services. What we like to see is we look at this from two different perspectives. When we're looking at a 10% admission rate for the emergency department, we want to look at it from the perspective of one, evaluating the level of services that are being sought in the emergency room but then also as a means to ensure that we're admitting the appropriate number of patients coming out of the emergency room. So what would happen is, is if we're not hitting that 10% of admissions off the ED volume, it can usually mean two different things. One is that if we're not hitting that 10%, there's often an over-reliance on the emergency room for non-emergent services. So maybe a lot of people are using the emergency room to seek for what should be primary care. However, due to the inability to get into a primary care practice, they're actually using the emergency department for those primary care services. The second thing we often see is that there's a disconnect between the emergency department group and the hospitalist group, where a lot of times maybe the hospitalist will say, oh, just transfer that patient, or the emergency department doesn't want to admit the patient and have to care for something on the floor if you had a shared model. So again, it's looking at those different factors and really evaluating that if we're not hitting that 10%, what are the causes and what can we actually do to improve that performance? As a follow-up to that is really implementing systems. And what we want to do is every patient that's actually transferred out to a larger facility for services, whether it's an acute admission or some more severe case, what we want to do is we want to continue to track those patients or follow up with that larger uh, facility because oftentimes those patients could be transferred back to your facility for swing bed services. I can't tell you how many times we've gone into a facility where they actually transfer patients out and instead of actually trying to get the patients to come back from a post-acute care perspective, those patients end up going into a long-term care facility into that larger area or near a, a nursing home in the larger service area of that larger hospital. So again, what we want to do is we want to continue to reach out and advise them that we do have a swing bed program or we offer certain post-acute care services so that when that patient is actually transferred out, there's a high probability that we can actually get those patients to come back. The next one is really around the care spectrum. Now, when we look at the care spectrum, the care spectrum is really defining the actual services that we can provide within our hospital. Most of the hospitals we go to it seems they've actually taken the approach of defining the patients they can't care for 
than actually focusing on the type of patients they can care for. And what they do is they often create these what if type scenarios. So what they do is they end up creating an environment where a patient maybe gets referred to them and they say, oh, well, what if this patient has that issue? Or what if something goes wrong here? And they often deny a number of patients because of those what if type scenarios. What we're advising organizations to do is to really create that care spectrum. And you can create it for both your inpatient, your swing bed, your emergency department, any other clinical department, we can define ultimately a care spectrum for services. And what we wanna do is we wanna evaluate all of those different services based on the different areas that can actually impact delivery of care within that service. So whether it's medical staff, nursing, pharmacy, medical equipment, insurance, rehab, we want to look at all of those different departments and evaluate each of those different departments relative to the certain services that we can offer. Now, this can actually serve in a couple different ways. The first way when we're looking at that care spectrum is one is it can provide us a snapshot of the type of patients that we can't provide care for. The second way we can actually use that information is, is if we find out that we could provide maybe bariatric services and we have every single thing except for a bariatric bed. Then what it would allow us to do is to say, if we were to buy a bed or some piece of equipment, then that would actually allow us to increase the number of referrals to our facility. Or same thing from a clinical competency perspective. Maybe we can do everything within our facility. However, maybe our staff are not up to, up to par on being able to take patients that can handle uh, or that need a trait need or wound care. So it allows us to use it from an educational perspective to say, here's are the barriers that are preventing us from increasing that spectrum and then using that as a means to actually educate our staff and use it from a growth perspective. So again, it's looking across the board as both one that we can use it as a marketing ploy and second, so that we can actually use it as an education and an increase of competency or equipment perspective. The next one really comes around swing bed program growth. And when we talk about the different areas with swing bed growth, the first one I really like to look at is around active solicitation. And what active solicitation is, now I know that it's, it's not really a, a politically correct term for soliciting to actually get patients, but it's more of a concept of an internal approach as opposed to a external marketing ploy. When we talk about active solicitation, active solicitation is the process of every day um, proactively going after patient volumes. So instead of waiting for referrals to come to your facility, it's actually reaching out to those facilities to find out what potential referrals they have, what patients do they have that may need post-acute care services, really going after that volume. Now, when we compare critical access hospitals to nursing homes, I would say that nursing homes are significantly better at going after post-acute care services. And they have to be because the bulk of their business is dependent upon the ability to get referrals into that nursing home. As a critical access hospital, because we provide a number of other services, swing bed often becomes a secondary focus for the organization. We want to ensure that it's actually a primary focus for that organization. To give you an example, the, the organization I was at, um, we ended up increasing our swing bed from seven to 14 within a six month period. So we were able to actually double our swing bed volumes. And we were able to do this by one, implementing that active solicitation approach where we actually had a specific individual that was tasked with increasing volumes for that department. So every single day that person was reaching out to larger hospitals in an effort to actually grow volumes for that department. It's a little bit different than like an emergency department or an acute or other services like that. We're not gonna walk around and say, hey, you know, come to our hospital for your acute care um, because that tends to happen as people are having a, a critical event or something that could actually lead to that service. The post-acute care, because it's actually leading from a discharge from a larger facility, we can more plan and approach that from that perspective of actually targeting those volumes and going for those services. And one, and also too, is really developing out a specific marketing approach. Oftentimes, larger facilities, one, do not understand the number of beds or the number of services that your hospital can provide. So what it's saying is really we want to reach out and work with the case managers to advise them on that information. 
We had actually taken a three-pronged approach um, when we reached out to those larger facilities. First, what we did is uh, me as a CFO at that time, I had actually reached out to the CFO of the larger facilities and had conversations around how many waitlisted patients they had and how much they were losing from having to actually divert patients. So I got their finance individual on board. Next, we had our hospitalists reach out to their hospitalists to talk about actually clinical care and outcomes and not having an increase in readmissions and all those factors. So it was hospitals to hospitalists. The last was our CNO actually reaching out to the case managers at the larger facilities to really talk about that process. And what we wanted to do was we approached that process in an effort to actually hit all of those three major areas. So what we didn't want to do was we didn't want to have somebody focused on one area and then realize that the CFO was specifically directing people due to maybe some joint venture or something else, trying to push people into a different area of business. So again, attacking it from three different angles to realize that there's multiple people within those services that have an impact or a say in where patients may actually go or certain referrals or just how they overall approach business from that perspective. The next what I wanna talk about is really the, the swing bed NF rate. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions we see out there with swing bed services is many people feel that they need to get whatever their Medicare cost-based rate is for swing bed services. And that's, that's, that's a big misconception that often leads to loss of business for critical access hospitals. So what ends up happening on the cost report is we are reimbursed for services from Medicare for swing bed services at cost-based reimbursement. When we end up taking a commercial or non-Medicare, non-Medicare Advantage patient, all of those patient days end up getting carved out at that cost, uh, the Medicaid nursing facility NF rate. So what this means is that if we end up negotiating maybe $1,000 a day from a commercial payer to put a patient in one of those post-acute care beds, and our Medicaid swing bed carve-out rate is only $200, that means that Medicare is only dinging us on the cost report at $200 times the number of days that that patient is there. So when we're getting $1,000 and we're only losing $200 on the cost report, that means that we're actually making $800 relative to the cost-based impact on the cost report. An organization in New York, they had actually negotiated, now I know this isn't also a politically correct term, but the, to do drug rehab type services or recovery services, they had negotiated with a commercial payer actually a $1,000 rate as a daily rate to take those type of patients their carve-out rate was roughly in the mid-250 range for that hospital in New York. So they were making $750 roughly relative to the cost-based impact as a carve-out. So it wasn't hurting them from a cost report perspective, and it was allowing them to actually turn a positive margin for those services. So it's really important that we continue to evaluate that swing bed NF rate and look at that from the means to say we can use this as a, a differentiator or actually a target to allow us to negotiate with commercial payers or other payers that are non-Medicare, non-Medicare Advantage type due to the cost report impact. The next one that I want to focus on is really the, the intensive care unit. I'm not sure many of us still are. However, there are a number of critical access hospitals that are still operating distinct uh, intensive care units in addition to their acute facilities. And when we go into those facilities and often ask them, we say, you know, if this patient was in Oklahoma City, would it really be an intensive care patient? Or are we kind of defining that as an intensive care patient based on the services we provide? And most times we find out that the patients that are actually in there are a progressive type patient and they're not actually a true ICU patient. So what I want to show you right here is when we're looking at the, the graphic or the chart up there or the table, what this looks at is a hospital that was actually operating an acute care facility, so an acute care bed. They also had an ICU, a distinct ICU. 
And what this looks at is it looks at the combined reimbursements of both the med surge unit and that ICU. And what it says is if this hospital were to combine the ICU into the med surge and just run a single combined unit that had both the ability to handle more acute patients and the regular med surge patients, what would that do in the way of reimbursement? And when we ended up doing that, we can see that the reimbursements for this hospital ended up increasing about $37,000. Now, they would be able to provide the same level of clinical care. They would have improved it from that perspective. What this doesn't look at is the net benefit for this hospital probably would have been higher because by combining those two units, they would have been able to create more efficiencies uh, within that department. This ICU has actually had two nurses, even though they may have only had one or two patients on at a time. If we look at the total days, we can see that they had a total of 421 days at that hospital. However, they were required to staff that unit because they couldn't have a single nurse on that unit. So they were required to staff at a higher level. So again, it's looking that as the business is changing and as we're able to get more telehealth services and things from that perspective to increase care, let's realize that it's not business as usual. Let's continue to tweak our environment going forward. I know we have about 20 minutes left. I'm going to pick up the pace a little. Um, but again, if we have questions, please uh, interrupt me and we can uh, continue to talk about all of these different factors. The, the next one is really around interqual and creating evidence-based information. So what we want to do is we want to establish those evidence-based standards, but we also want to rely on programs, whether it's Milliman or interqual to use those as a means to actually drive uh, patient admissions. Insurance companies are starting to deny admissions. So what we want to do is we want to rely on these certain programs to ensure that we're appropriately placing patients. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to unnecessarily admit a patient for acute level of care and then find out that it should have been observation or vice versa, admit somebody to an observation level of care and then find out that they should have actually been an acute level. So continuing to look at those different factors to say that we need to evaluate services and appropriately place people within those different departments. Another one is also looking at the, the, the nurse to patient ratios. Um, California actually published, and, and they're one of the most unionized states in the country. So California actually published uh, standards for nurse to patient ratios. We can build those into our standards or use those as a baseline to say, are we appropriately tracking relative to those nurse to patient ratios? So swing bed is usually an eight to one ratio. Med surge is usually a five or six to one ratio. ICU is a three to one ratio. How are we performing relative to those ratios? And ensure that we're actually staffing our departments, one, to provide adequate level of care, but two, to make sure that as we continue to have a decline in volumes, that we continue to operate at a, a less than efficient perspective. It, it's, it's amazing that as we've seen this entire COVID environment, the amount of work that's actually been getting done with either people being out of the office or not um, at their desk or, or just the decline in the number of people. So we want to make sure that we create those efficiencies so that people can actually provide those, those competent levels of care, but two, that we're not creating an inefficient environment based on the lack of volume. So continue to evaluate to those benchmarks. And last on this one, what we really want to focus on is we want to track our acute admission rate to our observation rate. Generally, our acute to admission observation rate should not be higher than 15 to 25%. If we have higher than 25% observation relative to acute, that means that we're either under admitting patients, uh, so maybe we're not meeting those requirements, or we're admitting to observation uh, to observe when maybe they could have been sent home or some other factor. The reason why this is particularly important for critical access hospitals is how patients are charged for outpatient services. So when a patient is admitted to an observation level of care and that patient has Medicare, their cost is actually 20% of the charge for those services. Whereas if they go on to the inpatient side, it's under a different reimbursement perspective and their co-insurance is actually different. So what we wanna make sure is that we don't over push a certain number of patients to observation and increase their patient responsibility. That can actually lead to a number of patients that either 
are not happy with our facility or seek patient care elsewhere because of how they're being charged for those certain services. The next area is really around emergent services. And when we focus on emergent services, what we really want to look at is we want to ensure that the emergency department is there for patients who actually need emergent care. Now, a lot of times in rural communities, maybe we don't have a primary care presence or it's only open certain hours or there's no urgent care and looking at those different factors. So a lot of times what ends up happening is, is that people will use that emergency department for their primary care needs. And that will end up over flooding the emergency department and it'll actually increase the cost of care for the facility as a whole because what ends up happening is, is that we now need to keep those providers there more frequently or maybe there's not as much time for that professional compensation that's being under the technical component or the facility component and all of it's being charged as the professional component so being removed from that cost report. So again, what we want to make sure is that as we're providing those services that we implement certain things, whether it's an ED redirect program or certain things from that level. Now, it's not to say to send patients away. What it's saying is that if a patient presents for non-emergent services and we have the ability to send them to another place of care, that we do that so that we're not overwhelming our emergency department again with those non-emergent services. The next is really looking at whether or not we, we implement those systems to have appropriate transfers. A lot of times what ends up happening is, is that we partner with an emergency department group that's maybe out of a larger facility or we have visiting providers and the standard practice is just to transfer those patients to that larger facility. Again, by creating that care spectrum, it allows us to continue to evaluate one, the patients that we're providing care for but two, to continue to work with our providers to ensure that the patients that can receive care at our facility do receive care. What we don't want to do is we don't want to send those patients elsewhere if they could receive care at our facility. One, it's not good to send patients to remote facilities or distant facilities um, when they're going to be admitted because families will often have a hard time getting to those facilities to visit their care for but then also the patients end up going to a larger facility instead of receiving care in your community, which hurts you financially. The last one in this area is really looking at the tracking the ED standby time. So when we look at ED standby time, the way the cost report works for critical access hospitals with our emergency room providers is that we can include the cost of standby time for our providers as an allowable expense on the cost report. And we have to carve out any corresponding expense for when that provider is providing care. Now, I like to refer to this as the kind of the three Ds for providers. When the provider is either documenting, delivering, or discussing care, that's considered the professional component and we have to remove the corresponding expense. Any other time is considered standby time. So even if a physician is waiting in the emergency room for test results to come back and they're not doing anything relative to patient care, that goes again back to standby time. Oftentimes what ends up happening is, is most critical access hospitals will use either the EHR or some other mechanism and say, when the physician comes into the emergency room, we're going to start the clock. When they leave, we're going to stop the clock. And what we end up seeing is that the professional time carve out averages anywhere from 45 minutes to 100 minutes per patient visit. The average amount of time for professional time across the country should be 20 minutes per patient visit. And for anybody that's gone to the emergency room recently and they say, okay, well, I've been in the emergency room, how often do you really see your physician? Um, most of you won't see them for 20 minutes, never mind 40 minutes or an hour. So again, the goal is, is to track that information so that you get most of it back onto your cost report. Now, again, we're doing this from the perspective of accuracy purposes. Um, by being more accurate and doing those studies allows us to get more cost back on the cost report, which actually re increases our reimbursement. And then the last is really around KPIs for the emergency department. Um, it's, it's really implementing those standards or implementing KPIs. Everything that we can track, we should be tracking uh, from a performance perspective, admission rates, transfer rates, uh, door to dock, all those different factors. We should be uh, using those as a means to one, improve patient outcomes, but then also improve um, our, our patient satisfaction with the emergency department. 
What we don't want to do is we don't want to have poor metrics or not even track those metrics and then not be able to actually improve financial performance or operational performance going forward. So again, we want to use those metrics to help drive outcomes and performance improvement. Quality improvement, um, again, and really what I'll focus on with quality improvement is, is to track all of the metrics we can. So what we want to look at is, is if we look at the evolution of quality improvement over the years, it's been quality improvement, performance improvement, evidence-based outcomes, using all of those different factors and really looking at how we can improve the performance of the organization. One thing I've come to realize is that there's still a big silo between finance or back of the house revenue cycle type functions and quality and the, the delivery of care. What we've really started working with hospitals is to start to break down those barriers between quality and finance, realizing that quality outcomes have a direct impact on financial performance and financial performance directly impacts what we can afford to do, who we can afford to hire, and how we can afford to staff departments. So realizing that we cannot continue to operate those areas in silos and that we need to start to break down those barriers. If we have a quality improvement committee, does it involve the CFO? Is there a business office director? Is there a coder on that committee? Um, if we have a revenue cycle committee, do we have nurse representation? Do we have a medical officer on that? Realizing that we cannot move the needle if we continue to operate in silos. We need to really bridge that gap and work forward to establish KPIs that both drives financial performance and quality outcomes. And what we've called that is, is a performance improvement executive committee. And, and what that looks at is it establishes a committee that says, as we continue to move forward, have a executive Maybe it's your CFO, CEO, CNO, and all of those different areas, CMOs, and major key areas, and have that drive the overall direction for the hospital from a performance improvement perspective. Then as we continue to move forward, create certain task groups that can focus on a certain initiative. I used to go to a number of meetings, and I don't think there's probably anybody on this call that says that they don't have enough meetings for the day and would actually like to attend more meetings. Um, so it's looking at it from that perspective to say, we, you know, me as a CFO, I didn't need to be involved in every single meeting at the hospital. There needs to be more trust and more pushing people out to actually do things and then start to report that back to the senior committee or that group of maybe department heads. What it also allows you to do is as you start to push out that work in different task groups is it allows you to one, create that linkage between quality and finance, but to also get the people that are directly responsible for either the patient care or the collecting of receivables or all those different factors to actually be a part of the process in making improvements since on the back end, they're the ones that are actually gonna be doing all the services. It's interesting how many hospitals we go into where a senior leadership team is creating all the processes and the outcomes without getting the feedback from the actual people that are performing the responsibilities. And then you end up getting those gaps where something doesn't work or the outcomes don't actually are successful because they're not involved in that process. The next is really around revenue cycle and we could probably spend the next three years just on revenue cycle. Um, when we look at revenue cycle, again, it's, it's to start to focus on outcomes and actually improving the performance of the organization. It's, it's creating that environment where we realize that the revenue cycle process actually starts from the point of when the patient is going to seek care all the way through the point of claims adjudication and any clearance of self-pay. A lot of people think that revenue cycle actually starts at the business office process or coding. It starts much sooner than that. And what we want to do is focus on certain areas like pre-registration and getting those things out of the way. We want to actually make sure that we're following up on insurance and providing certain services. It's using that revenue cycle process to improve the performance of the organization. Implementing a bad debt policy so that if patients aren't paying for their, their, their services, that we can actually write that off as worthless and get that on the cost report after it's gone through a collection company. Prioritizing point of service collection. Um, I can't tell you how many hospitals we go into where 
They don't try to collect co-pays or co-insurance at the time of service. A patient will come in and walk out and then there's no deposit or no payment for services to be provided. Implementing quick pay discounts. Um, and then the last is really looking at a comprehensive CDM review. So what we end up doing is, is that as you do that CDM review, you wanna make sure that you're charging appropriately, that you actually have a defensible pricing strategy. Um, realizing that as a critical access hospital, as we charge for services and how that cost gets passed on to Medicare beneficiaries, when we look at that, as we continue to charge for certain services, if we're offering, say, MRI, and the cost of an MRI is $3,000, is that patient going to come to you and pay $600 out of pocket for an MRI if they can go to a freestanding diagnostic center and pay $50? So it's realizing that patients are becoming more savvy as they're actually seeking those services. Um, again, it's, it's leveraging the information and using that information as a means to continue to push the envelope, ensuring that, again, we have that defensible pricing strategy and that we're not overcharging or undercharging for services. So I know we've been talking about 55 minutes and we have about five minutes left. Um, what I want to do is open it up for five minutes and allow people to ask questions about some of the stuff. I know we've gone over a ton of different information and different categories. Um, based on how we've kind of progressed, uh, what I'll probably do is a part two to this to focus on or actually get into the balance of the slides. Uh, but for now, I mean, for the next five minutes, I'll open it up. If there's any questions about any of the stuff, please ask. If not, then I guess we'll give everybody three minutes back of their, their day. Either everybody can't figure out how to get off mute or there's no questions. Hey, Jonathan, this is Corey. I just wanted to make sure that all the attendees knew that we were recording today's webinar and we'll record tomorrow's also. So the link will be made available after this and then um, so they'll have access to the, all the information, the slides and everything. Correct. So as Corey mentioned, it is recorded. Um, everything is recorded on the voice perspective. I didn't record any of the video, so we're, we're free from that perspective. So if there are no questions, um, tomorrow's presentation will actually be on top cost report opportunities. Um, to give kind of a little recap or a preliminary overview of that, what that will really focus on is, is our firm does a number of cost report reviews every year. So we work with a number of hospitals to review their cost report for, for opportunities to improve either the accuracy or reimbursement. Um, and we always say that we merge the science and art of cost report preparation. So what that will include is a number of recommendations or outcomes that we generally find from reviewing those cost reports. Many of those will lead to an increase in reimbursements. Many of those will lead to an improvement of financial performance. So that will be at the same time tomorrow. Um, I'll turn it over to Corey if she wants to give any parting thoughts, and then we will uh, let everybody go up on their day. Thank you very much to everybody for attending. Uh, if you do have any questions, my email is actually at the back of the, the slide deck. So please feel free to reach out or give me a call if you have anything that comes up after around the question. Sounds great. Thank you for your time, Jonathan, and for the information. And like I said, we'll make sure that the link and the slide set is available to everyone. So thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day.